To try, try, and try again. That's the challenge that faces those who would find success on the road through the wilderness. Today, a new generation of adventurers follows in the footsteps of their ancestors along the ancient Silk Road. Much has changed over the centuries, but one thing remains unchanged, the dream of betterment, to find that pot of gold, real or metaphoric, at the end of the rainbow. The Silk Road stretches through 11 time zones across the Eurasian continent, running across a landmass of in excess of 50 million square kilometers. For thousands of years, the Silk Road, or Silk Roads, for there were multiple routes, was the key artery connecting Europe and Asia. Jiangsu County sits in China's farthest northwest, close to the borders with both Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. It's a full 4,000 kilometers from Beijing. The silence of the grasslands is about to be rudely shattered by the biggest event in the area, the annual Gymkhana. Nuri Bali is a 10-year-old Kazakh boy. He's here with his father, who's come to take part. This is his first time to see the games close up. This type of equestrian sport is peculiar to Central Asia. It's called Buzz Kashi in Persian and the Afghan Dari language. In Kazakh, it's called Kak Par. It integrates the requirements of excellence in horse and horsemanship, along with the lightning quick reactions and well-drilled teamwork. It has been part of the culture of the Turkic and Mongol peoples of the grasslands for at least 1,000 years. Nuri Bali is practicing the skills his father just taught him. Horses are central to Kazakh culture, not simply as a means of transportation, but also as a symbol of their own identity. <laughs> the boy has a lot to learn, but he still has time. Players are supposed to peak in their 40s. 
It was the domestication of the horse and their breeding as beasts of transport that made it possible for men to move further and faster over land than ever before. The horse played a key role in the construction and maintenance of the great empires of the ancient world, Chinese, Persian, Macedonian, and Roman. In turn, these expanding empires brought contact with new civilizations at their fringes. In 138 BC, a young man called Zheng Qian left Chang'an, capital of the Han Dynasty, to explore the horizons beyond the Great Wall. Over 10 years, he traveled across grassland, desert, and mountains on a mission for the emperor to scout out the lands of the West. Although he failed to make contact with any ruler of equivalent standing, he did return with descriptions of a marvelous horse that could gallop faster than the wind. Intrigued by the tale of this magical beast, the Chinese searched for it ceaselessly. Su County was once the site of China's largest ranch for the raising of cavalry horses by the thousands. The age of the mounted cavalrymen may be long gone, but horses still play a vital role in the local economy. One man in particular is striving to restore these grasslands to their glory days. Chao Chun Jiang, 44, is the director of the Jiao Su Stud Farm, as well as a trainer of racehorses. Chao Chun Jiang is the first to arrive at the gallops each day. He keeps a close eye on both the horses and riders. The training is a sophisticated system, but if anything goes wrong, it could end up by ruining these expensive beasts. Everyone from stable lad to trainer has to be totally committed to the welfare of their charges. Like numerous adventurers in the history of the Silk Road, Chow is striving to fulfill a dream. Even if it means living far from home, it's only in these grasslands that he can find his destiny. Across the mountains in Kyrgyzstan, Abakirov is looking for new development opportunities for his company. While in the heart of Central Asia, Ju Chiang is working night and day to make sure the oil refinery he is working on is finished ahead of the deadline. Kyrgyzstan is a country surrounded by mountain ranges of Central Asia. This has not prevented it from being fought over by the great empires of history. Most recently, it was one of the states of the Soviet Union, and the Russian influence is still highly visible in its capital, Bishkek, a city with a population of slightly over one million.
At the presidential palace, a forum organized by former president, Otan by Iva, gathers the elites from all walks of life. Government ministers, bankers, industrialists, inventors, leading performers in the arts and media. In short, all those who can influence the Kyrgyz economy. At 36, Abakirov is the president of a tech company. Young entrepreneurs like him are the hope for an economic recovery in Kyrgyzstan. Мне кажется, что советское прошлое уже давно как бы, позади, да? И нам нужно строить новую экономику. Экономику, основанную на свободных рыночных отношениях. Поэтому, но, поэтому вот э, в этом направлении нам надо двигаться. Kirov is a pioneer in his country, but the going has not been easy. He believes that science and technology are the only way forward for his country's economy. Struggling in a difficult environment, his company has shrunk from 30 employees to less than half that number. Abakirov once studied in Japan. In his office, he keeps a piece of calligraphy from those days, with a Chinese character for dream written on it. Ну, я все-таки хотел бы дальше продолжить заниматься бизнесом. И сейчас мы платим налоги, там создаем рабочие места, несем какую-то идею. Это мне кажется то, чем я могу быть полезен. The Kyrgyz are one of the oldest nations in Central Asia. But as a country, Kyrgyzstan is still very young. The dilapidated factories inherited from the former Soviet Union are mostly bankrupt. Kyrgyzstan needs to rebuild its economy from these ruins. The traditional nomadic lifestyle of the Kyrgyz is changing at a pace unseen before. <laughs> I.E. Yan is a Dungani. The Dungans are Muslims of Chinese origin spread across the Central Asian region. The 60,000 Dungans in Kyrgyzstan make them the nation's fourth largest ethnic group. Although born into a traditional Muslim family, Ai Yan lives a very different lifestyle from that of traditional Dungani women. The 22-year-old works with her father in a Dordoi bazaar, selling goods imported from China. I. E. Yan is carving a new career for herself in the Dordoi Bazaar. Her shop is made from four shipping containers. Above the shop is their storeroom. The Dordoi Bazaar is itself something of a marvel. Thousands of shipping containers in the middle of the wilderness. Almost overnight, it became Central Asia's biggest distribution center for small goods items. Economists estimate that the bazaar has created nearly 55,000 jobs. Goods from all over the world can be found there, but the greater part are from China. In one decade, trade between China and Kyrgyzstan has grown tenfold, making China its second largest trade partner. <laughs> 
the economic development of countries along the route of the Silk Road, and in particular, the rapid economic growth of China in the past 30 years has seen international trade flourish. For Dungans like IEN, this is a rare opportunity for a better life. In Italy, the western end of the Silk Road, people are also trying to rejuvenate an old economy through a serious effort. In the town of Prato, the squares, churches, bell towers and fountains look much the same as they might have during the Renaissance. But there's another Renaissance taking place here, and travelers along today's Silk Road are behind it. A few streets from Prato's main square, you will find Italy's largest Chan Buddhist temple. It's a social and cultural center for the lives of the local Chinese living here and who raised the funds to build it. Jin Chaoqing is the owner of a fabric company. She is one of the first Chinese to have settled in Prato. The Chinese in Pronto have successfully built a lifestyle in accord with what they might have enjoyed back in China. Almost every day sees Chinese wedding feasts in Pronto, and attendance of such celebrations is part of Jin Xiaocheng's daily routine. In 20 years, Pronto has grown into the Italian city with the largest Chinese community. When Jin Xiaocheng first came here, Prato was one of the fabric centers in Europe. Ten years on, she found the opportunity to start her own factory. More and more Chinese moved to Prato, bringing their energy and industry with them. Jin Xiaocheng's garment company sells about 8,000 items of clothing every day. Her products are sold across Europe. This revival of the local economy brought about a change in the attitude towards the Chinese. The Italian garment industry had been struggling even before the crisis in the financial world. People demonstrated in the street, protesting against reductions in benefits and increasing unemployment. When the Chinese took up the challenge of the rag trade, they managed to maintain quality of production while reducing costs. This helped the town retain its threatened status as a European center for fabric production. Like many of the Chinese here, Jin Xiaocheng's life is mostly all about work. In 10 years, Jin Xiaocheng has transformed herself from a worker 
to a successful business owner. Today, her company is responsible for marketing and sales only. July is when the pastures on the Jiaosu grassland are harvested for hay. The hay will feed the horses throughout the long freezing winter. Scything by hand helps distribute the grass seed for next year. Jiaosu is one of the biggest grasslands in China. The surrounding Tian Shan Mountains keep most of the vital moisture in their giant basin. Chao Chun Jiang grew up on a ranch. He has a deep feeling for horses. Chow understands horses. They are loyal and express their feelings in their own unique ways. Have just shy of seventeen hands. Star of Western Territories is the champion of the Jiaosu grassland racing scene. He carries the hopes of Chao Chun Jiang stables at the upcoming race meet. <laughs> These horse boxes are the most luxurious vehicles of the whole of the Jiaosu grassland. Equipped with the most advanced air conditioning and water supply systems, the star of Western Territories and his team are retracing the route that Zheng Qian trod 2,000 years ago in search of that sensational steed. The length of the Silk Road sees today's strivers seeking to build a future to match the glories of ages past. IEN in Bishkek, always ready to fly a new kite. Jin Shao Ching in Prato, seeking new business a la mode. Bravo. 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 In the Kunlun Mountains, hard men seek ancient treasure from deep underground.
Meanwhile, for Abakirov and his friends, the challenge is to create a whole new road to prosperity. Highway 41 connects the north and the south of Kyrgyzstan. It coincides exactly with one section of the ancient Silk Road, running through mountains and across farmland to Osh in the Fergana Valley. The roadside signs in Chinese indicate its closeness to China. This is the construction site for Kyrgyzstan's largest foreign investment project, a 1 billion yuan Chinese-funded oil refinery. Fifty-eight-year-old Zhu Qiang is the general manager of the project. In his previous existence, he was an expert on fruit trees. He sees the refinery as the fruitful result of the new Silk Road partnership. Zhu believes his honest endeavors are the best way to earn respect for his motherland. Beef noodles are always a favorite in the workers' canteen. They come from thousands of miles away and from all across China. The project employs more than 2,000 workers from 16 different companies and organizations. They have less than three months before their deadline. Zhu is on what seems like a mission impossible. However, the Chinese managers believe they have a secret weapon. For the workers, to work outside China is a rare opportunity. It means higher pay, but it also means separation from their families. The July temperature in this barren area reaches over 40 degrees Celsius at midday. The surface temperature of the steel they are working with is over 70 degrees. Zhu Qiang has been on the project for three years. He has witnessed the refinery as if it was grown out of the earth. And he has found himself acclimatized to this wild and arid land. As with most other Chinese building projects overseas, the construction site is in a completely closed world of its own. The workers are not allowed to leave the compound unless they have special permission. This keeps them focused on the job in hand, even if it means their lives are lived in a somewhat monotonous circuit of dormitory, canteen, and construction site. In the heart of the Eurasian landmass, a group of miners are fighting their way through mountains up to 6,000 meters above sea level. 
If the construction workers at the refinery have the most modern technology at their disposal, the miners cross the mountains in the same way their forebearers might have done centuries ago. Their work is difficult and dangerous, and one which has been carried on generation after generation. They have come to take one of nature's treasures. They are deep in the Kun Moon mountain range and the treasure they seek is jade. In the evening, they finally reach their camp, 4,400 meters above sea level. More than 20 of them rest together. A 20-inch TV showing kung fu films dubbed in Uyghur provides some light relief before they sleep. Tomorrow will be even harder. The next morning, a heavy snow lies across the whole Kun Loon. The temperature plummets to minus 10 degrees Celsius, but they can brook no delay. Every year, the mining season lasts but four months, from May to September. This mine has been exploited for a few centuries. Throughout most of the year, it is iced over. But what lies in the mountain's heart is the famous Hatien white jade. In imperial times, it was used to make objects for the very emperor himself. The mine sits at the foot of a glacier at an altitude of over 4,000 meters. The dust in the mine's workings make it difficult for the miners to breathe. Each carrying over 50 kilograms of jade on their backs. The miners have to march for 10 hours on foot through the mountains to get to their market. For the miners of Hatien White Jade, this journey has been repeated again and again, century after century. Apart from the use of explosives, the miners work in exactly the same way as their ancestors did centuries ago. Three thousand years ago, in the Shang Dynasty, Ha Tian Jade was shipped across deserts and mountains to central China. The route would have been the same as the later Silk Road. <laughs> Buy low and sell high is the key rule of commerce. However, on the heels of man's desire for self-enrichment have come new ideas, new practices, new ways of thought and belief. The history of the Silk Road has seen times of chaos and disaster to match those of peace and prosperity. But whatever else, it was never an easy road. Now it's being revived again as nations and individuals awaken to its prospects. I 
Y-E-N is part of a young generation who grew up in independent Kyrgyzstan. Her husband used to be a prosecuting attorney, but he works side by side with his wife in the bazaar. At 22, I.E.N. is already the mother of a six-year-old. Although having lived in Central Asia for over a hundred years, the Dungans are still true to a Chinese lifestyle, especially in food and language. And it's the language that has given them the opportunity to form the bridge between China and Central Asia in trade. I.E.N. and her family have found their lives are quietly changing. This is the biggest second-hand car market in Kyrgyzstan. With their vehicles from Germany, the young couple set up in the market undaunted by what they still need to learn about this business. The import taxes are low, and second-hand autos are cheap in Kyrgyzstan. Most families own two cars, Even the public transport in Bishkek uses second-hand buses from Germany. has set up a new business in the Medina Bazaar, a newly opened market to sell toys from China. Compared with the Dor Doi Bazaar, the new market doesn't yet have many customers, but I.E. Yan believes this will change. Kirov and friends are taking a trip back to nature. It's here that he finds the true essence of Kyrgyzstan. And so we discover Abakirov, the resourceful software developer, has turned apiarist and is planning to export Kyrgyz mountain honey to the waiting world. The only connection between these projects is his dream of a burgeoning Kyrgyz economy.
The horse has played a vital role in human history. Horses were first domesticated around 4000 BC. It enabled men to travel at speeds undreamt of. A horse can reach speeds of over 40 kilometers an hour. With the establishment of relay stations, a rider or messenger could cover up to 500 kilometers a day. Before the Industrial Revolution, there were no faster methods of travel. After an overnight journey of 1,000 kilometers, Chao Chunjiang finally arrives at his destination, a racetrack in East Xinjiang. Now they have less than 24 hours to prepare Star of Western Territories for his race. seems off color. A cold is diagnosed. To bring down his fever, the team vet decides to put him on a drip. When a horse races at high speed, its body temperature will rise dramatically. Hot weather will obviously exacerbate the problem. The runners are doused in water to keep them cool. With his fever running high, it's looking doubtful whether Star should start in the race. Since there is no time to warm up properly, the team helps Star relax his muscles with a massage. After another thorough examination, Chao Chun Jiang decides to take a risk and let Star of Western Territories run in the race. <laughs> On the first circuit, Star leads the field. Second, he begins to tire and slow down. In the end, his jockey pulls him up, and he doesn't even finish. Oh, 
出发。来自木里龙翔满速代表队。来呀！举枪，马上了。紧跟其后的这个穿着白色上衣的，是我们的四号骑手。赛马的比赛已经结束，接下来马上就要进行的是国产马五千米速度赛马的角逐。In hindsight, withdrawal would have been the wiser course. All the months of work Chow and his team put in have been spoiled by a cold. The star of Western Territories could not retain his title. Many along the Silk Road are treading a path forged by their ancestors, trying to recapture those days of glory. The Silk Road is a road of dreams, a path by which individuals can fulfill their desires, bringing home wealth and honor, along with a richness of experience in contact with people and places beyond their previous imagining. Music professor Ka Lili from a Silk Road country has found the life he wanted in China. To him, the greatest challenge is to conquer oneself even more than the outside world. Join us for part two of Silk Road. The journey goes on. <laughs>